Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. Tonight, we have a member of iconic bands such as Count Me Out, Renee Hartfeld, and Memorial, Pete Appleby. Woo! Yeah! Pete, welcome. How you doing? I'm great. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Now, this is a funny story. I, I've actually been trying to track you down for a while to get you on the show. Now, are you a dentist? I am a dentist. That's Okay, so I knew it was you. Now, because I, I would search your name... And, you know, Pete Appleby Dentistry would come up, and I'd be like, he's a dentist now? <laughs> and, and then, I, like, my brain just wouldn't, like, allow that connection to happen, so I'd get distracted and go off somewhere that's else. That's hysterical. I, I, there, there was times I, I did think about that, maybe, that uh, that's going to be the first thing you're going to see about me if you were to look. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So one day, you know, I, I saw Count Me Out mentioned somewhere, and I was like, all right, I got to get this guy on the show. So I search again, and I pull up the dentist picture of you. And then I pull up an old Renee Hartfeld picture, and I'm doing like a, like a like a uh, side by side. Yeah, oh, this yeah. Is detective work. All right, wow, I'm impressed. Yeah, and, and I was like, this this is him. And then to <laughs> to really make sure it was you, I went on the dentist site, and it said like, oh yeah, he uh, he enjoys music, playing music or something. I'm like, that's him. That's got to be him. And then I realized you're following us on Instagram. I didn't even realize that. Which is funny because I think Jason Mazzola had tagged something where you maybe had mentioned Memorial. Yes. Yeah. And so that's how I learned about you guys. That's okay. insane. So he connected us. That's awesome. Yeah, I did I did a Renee Hartfelt slash Memorial post, and then I posted The Great Lakes, because that's an awesome song. And now here we are. Uh, so sweet. And it's so wild that it was the Great Lakes because that was, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think that was ever released. It was posted on the band's MySpace as a, as a B-side, like, I don't know, 12 years God, ago. MySpace, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> that sounds about right, though. I could see us doing that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, anyway, well, I, I had lost that track myself. I didn't even have a copy of it. So it's <laughs> pretty wild. Well, I'm glad I uh, I did a low quality rip of it when I did because I knew I knew eventually this is going to be gone and I'll never hear yeah, it. Yeah, same here. You may have the last copy. I don't know. I mean, seriously. <laughs> oh, thank God I have it then. So, Pete, well, first of all, where are you located? I'm in Richmond. I'm back in Richmond, Virginia. Okay. Have you always lived there, or did you live other places? No, I was born in Chicago, right outside of Chicago, and moved to Richmond in '93. Oh, okay. Um and I was in Charlottesville for college, and then I went out to L.A. for a year, but essentially have stayed in Richmond. It's just that awesome. Why did you move to Richmond? Well, I was young. I was only 13, and uh, my wow. yeah, the old man got a new job. So we picked up, moved down to Richmond. I was kicking and screaming. I hated the idea of it. You know, just coming from Chicago, it seemed like it was just going to be farmland and backwoods and kind of southern philosophy and everything from what little I understood at that age, but I definitely was aware of that mm -hmm. and not looking forward to it. And I felt like I was kind of in this metropolitan area of skateboarding and we were starting to take the L downtown. It was sort of kind of, the city was just opening up a little bit and then it was like, oh yeah, we're leaving. Oh. So yeah, you know, but so we ended up back in, in Richmond and, but that's really where I discovered probably music or at least playing music. I had some I had a close friend, Chris Swan in Chicago. That was a phenomenal musician. His parents mm -hmm. played in symphony. And so I was certainly exposed to it, but wasn't really playing it. Um, played trumpet in the band and the school ah. band. So when did, when did you pick up a guitar for the first time? Uh, I want to say it was like 95. My brother uh, was starting to get into like the punk Richmond punk scene. Yeah, and um, through that, decided he was gonna. He bought a drum set because he wanted to start a band, and his be best friend wanted to play drums, and so he got a drum set. And we had a basement, and he, all of a sudden we had a drum set, and then he had a bass guitar, and then as it goes, when you have the you know the drum set and you have practice at your house, the the instruments are usually left there and collect there, and I was of course picking all that stuff up, um, and we were doing little bands together and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden I was picking up the guitar, so probably around then, but. You know, learning to play guitar as you would learning, to, you know, as a punk guitarist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I figured out, someone taught me, like, basic tablature, how to read it, 
in one of my high school classes. And yeah. it, was, it was like I had discovered uranium. I'm like, wait, I can do this. And that's, yeah. how, <laughs> that's how I made the jump from bass to guitar. No, oh, that's sweet. And I mean, it was a bit like, you know, unless you were taking lessons, yeah, you could go like buy a book. And I mean, kids did it. And there were, there were people who were just already so good at that age. But um, it was hard. It was like you had to mine out information on how to play just like the whole idea behind playing power chords and those types of songs. It was literally just right. Listen to the record and do what your friend did. You know, is that yeah. kind of education, at least for me, figuring out chords and how things work together. I sure wish I had taken lessons to start. Probably would have been a lot shorter path. Yeah, I took a few lessons, but it just wasn't like they want to teach you theory and they bring out the Mel Bay bass book and like, why do they always do that? They need to hit you first with the ACDC song and then go to that. Yes. yes. Right. Like I wanted to learn Texas is the reason and promise ring and Weezer and like, yes. you know, they, they just weren't feeling that. They were probably not feeling that. They were like, what? Yeah. See yeah. the dude I took I took I took two guitar lessons and the guy I took it from uh the first lesson was literally like here's how you tune the guitar here are the strings on the guitar um the these are what tone knobs do and like a basic like primer on like what a guitar does and I was like okay cool and he's like yeah I want you to like come up with like an idea of like a song that you might want to learn and I was like all right cool and when I came back I think I was in maybe seventh grade I was like I want to learn this Metallica song he's like okay hold on one second and he literally walked away and went to the front of the it was at a music store and he went to the front of the music store and got the book off the rack and made a photocopy of it and was like okay hold on and he was like showing me how to read the tab and I was like Oh, okay. So I remember I walked out to the car when I was done my lesson and I asked my mom, I was like, I need $20. And she's like, why? And I'm like, I'm going to buy this book about music. And she's like, oh, okay. And I walked back in, I bought the Metallica black album transcriptions and then walked right back out to the car and never went back to a guitar lesson. Ever <laughs> wow. <again>. wow. <laughs> ever. Like my mom was like, that's the best $20 I've ever spent. Like, it was yeah. like you sat in your room for like eight months. It's like, wow. That's- that sounds like a cool teacher, though. Dude, he was the, the nicest guy. He actually played in a bunch of bands um, in Willow Grove yeah. that were like um, cover bands. And he was really big into, he played in a Led Zeppelin cover band and a Black Sabbath cover band. And then I forget what the other one was, but he was in a like super good music. His name was Lou. I don't remember what his real, like his last name was, but he's a really, really nice guy. And he was just like, yeah, dude, if you want to learn how to play guitar, this is how you do it. And it was luck at a draw like that, too, that you would, if you got a good guitar teacher or something like that, that could totally send you on a different trajectory than you got the guy that was phoning it in. And now you have your, you know, it's at your fingertips for free. You just have to look. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible what the internet's done. Well, my daughter does, uh, like, we, we do guitar lessons together and we do it through, um, there's like a free, uh, there's a bunch of free different things on uh, YouTube. But she literally will hear a song and go, I want to learn how to play this song. So she picked, uh, last week, she picked the song from Brave. And she was like, I want to learn this song. And I was like, okay. And I found somebody that did a tutorial. And it was just, it's four chords. And I was like, cool, let's just do it. Let's let's go downstairs and learn it. And then we put it on the iPad. And then we slow it down and do like the playback speed and put it to 50%. And we just go through it piece by piece and learn oh, it. That's nice. cool. It's got to be fun, like learning stuff like that with your kids. I mean, that's the dream, man. It's an amazing feeling. At the same time, it really is like, um, it's so frustrating because like, I get it right away. And then I'm like, all right, here, just put your hands like this. And she's struggling. Like, she's just like, well, my fingers aren't big enough. And it's like, she has a a three quarter size guitar. um, But like, she's still like, really has a hard time positioning her fingers. And it's like, so it's it's ultimately it's so rewarding when she makes these breakthroughs but the biggest thing i've learned from it is like really learning how to be patient like it's just it's the ultimate practice of like okay i got it now show somebody else to do it like it it's 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 my job in a nutshell anyway i mean it's what i do for a living is teaching people how to do math but it's like it's really the same exact idea but almost in slow motion. Like you really have to break it down piece by piece. Like how do you move your fingers? Where is your thumb on the back? How much pressure? Are you- and you don't want to be like the asshole dad, like, no, you're doing it wrong. And like, oh yeah. Well, no, cause that, that's the biggest thing is, is like you consistently have to take a step back from it and be like, okay, what am I doing in this moment to make her 
have fun with this because ultimately the moment she stops having fun with it is the, the moment I want her to step away from it. Pete, you're living in Virginia. You're learning to play guitar. What, how did you discover the scene? It was through your older brother? Yeah, classic story, right? But he was driving myself and my friends and we were skateboarding together. And, you know, through skateboarding, I think it's an interesting hobby because they're like older kids doing it, younger kids doing it. So I think to some degree that got us involved in going to shows and having knowing people that were old enough to drive us. So, and there was, you know, unlike Chicago, at least what I knew, Richmond had this really burgeoning punk hardcore scene with some really awesome bands. I'm sure heard of Avail and Oh yeah, Four Walls yeah. Falling was a definitely Richmond's one of the, the bigger hardcore bands, and all that was transitioning because it was kind of '90s sound. So I definitely yeah. remember Earth Crisis, their seven inch, their second seven inch. That was like an enormous. That came out, we were just like, oh my god, and we kind of <laughs> jumped from uh, a little more like Gorilla Biscuits, and we didn't know anything, but th- those types of bands that we were just finding at the record store. Um, into that sound and then richmond really embraced it and there was that like every weekend there would be a, some sort of show with that kind of sound going on and that was it i was hooked and i was playing in high school in like a pop punk band called the nuns yeah uh, so i really kind of said all right i'm gonna play drums like i can you know and that was really where i cut my teeth just learning how to be in a band i think uh it, burn the priest was from richmond too yeah, that sounds right yeah I mean, so many, if you're looking at Guar. <laughs> so Guar, Skate Park. Guar's from there, really? I just knew the dudes from Lamb of God and like Burn the Priest guys where I was like, these are like the tightest musicians I've ever seen live. And I was like, where are these dudes from? And they're like, oh, somewhere down south. Yeah, Lamb of God is insane, <laughs> insane. But it was cool, though, to have, I mean, um, to have a veil. I mean, that was such a huge band to see that at a young age and like be like, wow, look at this, like huge venue, all these people going crazy for it. Um, and just that whole aesthetic and vibe, I, it, I was immediately drawn to it. But anyway, I started playing drums and in high school. And then through that, I'm actually trying to think how I got involved with Count Me Out, um, originally called What the Fuck. I was going to say, I, I, I saw that on uh, I, somebody's write up about it. it was like, you guys, your first couple shows were What the Fuck. And I, it was like, thankfully, they changed their name. <laughs> it's oh, like... yeah, so uh, that's right. We started, a, we started a hardcore band called Balance. And uh, it was my buddy Jared sang for the band. And we, I think we had two singers. And we were just, you know, kind of a moshy hardcore band and, and loved it. And Charlie Flexen saw us play at Twisters. And he was starting What what the Fuck with Jason Mazzola and a few other people. And then all of a sudden, they needed a drummer. He didn't want to play drums anymore. He wanted to play bass. So I got involved with them. But I was still in high school and they were in college. So my uh, just real quick, Pete. Like I, this is you can cut this, Keith, because this is gonna be this is gonna be totally nerdy shit. Uh, I I was just looking over. So, so you went to UVA. Did you go like right from high school to UVA and then like playing bands for a while while you're in UVA or like how did it right. work? So no, I I started. I got a scholarship to VCU and um, a half scholarship. So I lived at home and went to VCU for two years and wanted to do for Count Me Out because I really want to play in Count Me Out. I didn't want to go around. I was gonna go to Virginia Tech but it's too far away. And I was like, screw that. I'm gonna stay at VCU. And then two years into VCU, I, I mean, I was loving life. Everything was good, but I applied to UVA to transfer there. Cause I thought that was, I could go to that school. It was only 45 minutes, an hour away. I could make that work and still with the band. Um, and it's Charlottesville. Charlottesville right? And I was a big, I'm a huge rock climber. I was really big rock climber then. And I thought, oh, okay, that's, you know, it's just, a, it'll be a perfect mix. Um, and proceeded to do that. But, uh, yeah, that's another story because in a way that sort of, it was melancholy, man. I was so driven because I was pre-med and I just went as a transfer. So I didn't know anyone. I had a few friends from high school who went, but we kind of diverged on paths. And I, yeah, it was wild, man. I ended up living, uh, I moved to Cherry Street Avenue and I lived in like a four person efficiency where everyone had their own bedroom and bathroom, but we shared a living room and kitchen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I like, I, you know, I leave VCU. I'm like with all my friends, I'm in this, I'm kind of in the mix there. I'm living in my mom's attic. Um, I really had, a, I really was enjoying myself and then went to UVA, got uber focused and, you know, it's a different school environment for sure. And then I'm living in this efficiency with like a cab driver, a graduate student, um, these, <laughs> these like four people that like would essentially got sold on like coming over to the States on like a work study program, but really yeah. just cleaned up the movie oh, theater overnight. 
And they were from like somewhere in Russia, kind of a, anyway, they just smoked cigarettes out front. So here I am, I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? But I, the story, I, I'll tell it to you anyway, is just that the, my kind of my first memory really of being at UVA, I mean, of course I was just in the library, I was major in biology, um, but uh, I'd be studying and I always wake, woke up early and drink coffee and this cab driver downstairs would sleep through his freaking alarm because he was a late night cab driver. So the mm-hmm. alarm would just be going off and I'm in there studying. And um, finally, I, you know, I'd go downstairs and cut the power to his room. And one of his, the, the other roommates were like, yo, if it runs more than 10 minutes, just cut the power of his room so it'll cut off. It's fine. He doesn't get mad. I was like, all right. So on and on, we went for a couple of months. And then I remember cutting the power and then it didn't come on like the next day, which I thought was a little weird. And then it didn't come on another day. Oh, no. And then, yeah. Like I came home from school and there was an ambulance in the, the parking lot and the guy had died in his sleep. Oh, oh yeah. my God. Okay. Don't cut this. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fuck. No. <laughs> well, what's kind of wild is at that point I was doing, I was kind of getting into, I, I just had a lot of alone time. And so that's when I was really starting to write what would become kind of Renee Heartfelt, I guess. But mm-hmm. with some more just, you know, just not doing hardcore anymore, right? kind of thinking more about um, the next step musically. But yeah, meanwhile, I'm sure one of those mornings, maybe he was dead downstairs poor guy it was horrible yeah that sounds like a very renee heartfelt like (laughs) song you know situation overly dramatic yeah this is one of the things that and this is what i I, this is the only reason i gravitated towards that when i was like uh i i don't remember when it came out but i was super into uh silence of the lambs that movie and there's a portion of that film where she meets the guy who's like becomes her mentor at the fbi and she goes, oh, I remember you were a guest lecturer at UVA. And I remember like dissecting that film being like, what is UVA? And then I went and looked it up. So when I was in high school, I was like, I'm going to go to that school. Like that's where Clarice Starling went to school. I'm fucking going to this. Sc-. And and then I looked at the SAT scores and I was like, 1470. Fuck, dude, I'm not going to the school. <laughs> Yeah, there's some good people there for sure. Yeah, I was like, I was like, this is definitely not the this is not the place for me. <laughs> so, was the plan always to go into dentistry, or did or did you want to go into a medical field and you just didn't know which one yet? I was kind of medical field. I kind of re- I think I wanted to be an ER doctor, mm-hmm. um, but I uh, I did do like a I don't even want to call it a walk on. I think I like hung out in in a hospital through some I can't remember how, but I kind of got the feeling that. I don't like being in a hospital so much. Yeah. Um, and then I had a, just a chance encounter rock climbing. Um, and I shouldn't say chance encounter. There's a guy who's a local at a rock climbing gym that I worked who was a dentist. And he was a huge mentor in my life in that way. And was like, hey, you should think about dentistry if you're interested in medicine. And sort of, so that was great. I got to go and uh, work with him on a, on a couple of different days at his office. And uh, oddly enough, his office I ended up working at years later. Um, sort of just by chance, which is great. So, but yeah, Chris Dios is a great guy. And he kind of just, you know, has, like same with the guitar teacher, it, that first encounter sometimes kind of invents it or at least kind of reinvents it for you. Of like, oh, you know, I had certainly had an idea what a dentist does. And then he sort of like reframed that. I was like, oh, I had no idea it was like this. And all of a sudden I left, yeah, stopped thinking about medicine and was totally focused on dentistry. Um, and it's just essentially the same track from a college standpoint. Cause it's, you do, so you did four years of like pre-med, like bio, like cell histology stuff. And then you moved into, so w- when you go to dental school, it's, it's four it's years. It's four right? years. That's right. So it's definitely a little different. I mean, the, the two things split and, uh, the first two years are very similar first years of medical school where it's a lot of just, you know, anatomy, um, all the general systems, of the human body, pathology, all that stuff. And then you though, second two years, you start working in the mouth and working with all the different little things that dentists have to do that's totally unique from medicine, completely, almost completely separate in the way we treat the mouth and teeth. I always have an admiration for people that, that uh, like, especially I remember just uh, my roommate in college um, was a chemistry major and he would go off about two things, P chem and O chem. And I was like, I don't, what is the difference, dude? And I remember looking through his textbook one night. I, I think I had just come home from like, being out, I played lacrosse in college. Like I was out drinking with my friends and I was like, Oh, let me look at Mike's textbook. And I was just like, Oh no, (laughs) (laughs) this is, this is so unbelievably complicated. And it was just to him, like it, it, something clicked 
with Ochem. Like, Pchem was just, like, so bad for him. Like, he was just struggling with it. And then when he got into organic chemistry, I remember it clicked for him. And it was just so awesome to watch him because, like, people would come over and be like, dude, were you in today's lecture? And he's like, yeah. He's like, can you explain this to me? And he would have, like, three or four people sitting around him. And he would literally just sit there and draw diagrams. And I'm like, holy shit. There are so many people at this school doing shit that I, I have literally no concept of. Like, it was, it was so eye-opening for me. Yeah, you bring up I an mean, organic chemistry, man. That is the great widow maker, or at least the dream ender, so to speak. So many people that that course, right? <laughs> but I'm with you, man. I mean, the it's and especially if you're going up at the graduate level in physical chemistry, any chemistries, any of the sciences, it's just unbelievable. Pete, were you always balancing college and whatever band you were in at the time? Yeah, I think so, man. Did Count Me Out tour nationally? We did. Actually, we did a couple of US tours. We did Europe. And then that was the strain. I mean, at first it wasn't bad because Garth, Charlie, myself, and Colin were all in college. We were all taking, we were all full-time students or at least part-time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then working, everybody worked as well. And then we'd try to figure out how we were going to do the band. So it usually worked out that like anytime with spring break, summer break, we always had a tour. Winter break, always had a tour. Yeah. Which was one of those things too, where it's like, it was awesome and I loved it, but I did sometimes notice, you know, you're your friends are going to Mexico or your friends are going to whatever or just hanging out <laughs> yeah, or working and making money. And you're, you know, it's not, you know, you're going and grinding it out and it's not like we were playing these huge venues. We'd be playing at VFW hall or like a, a Shoney's in Nebraska, right? With, you know, 10 people. And, and you're like, and then you get home and you're right back to school. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I was on the road with a friend's band and yeah, you're in the Midwest. Sometimes there's 10 people there. Sometimes there's five people there. And then you go right home and work. And I don't know. It, it, I liked it at the time. Then again, I was 20 years old. I don't know if I'd like it as much now. But uh, And I think that's a, it's like a young man's game. It's so fun when you're that age. You don't care. You're like living yes. the dream and you're living your passion and balancing it all. I felt like I felt definitely in tune with things. But yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> so how does that band come to an end? And how do you start to segue into what would become Renee Hartfelt? <laughs> you know, count me out. I mean, that was we were really good friends so we always it, we were in europe having a great time although mm-hmm. it was there was a lot of shows nunkritz germany and like you know on christmas eve where it was just kind of random and the way the shows i mean it was booked tight we had a show every night but some of the shows you're just like what is this like we're playing a squat and that you know the, what the crowd that's there is never like would have nothing to do with our type of our music at all um but there we were and i mean and we still gave it our all and I, you know the, it was awesome, but I think we could tell towards the end of that tour that Charlie was definitely ready to not be straight edge anymore. Um, and I was changing some of the, maybe he was just ready to kind of move on to his next step in his life. He was big in his design. I think he was looking at other bands. Colin had been offered or had already been playing, I think, with American Nightmare. So that was, and they were taking off huge. And I think he was drawn like, I, you know, I'm not going to have time to do this like I'd like. I think Jason wanted to keep doing it but realized that he didn't want to do it at the, you know, he didn't want to keep doing it at our level. We wanted to keep growing, write another record or, you know, yeah, don't be a band anymore. So kind of the end of the European tour, although we were all getting along great and as close as we'd, as we'd ever been, um, it just sort of had a natural ending there. We played our last show in, uh, in Richmond, sort of unannounced. So the, was that a thing, like everyone was straight edge, and if we decide someone's not going to be straight edge anymore, like the band can't be a band anymore? You know, I, 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 it's, there's some years between that event, so I can't say I'm saying this totally accurately, but I yeah. think we definitely were aware that we were a straight edge band. I mean, we felt, I mean, in 110, few and far between, we were a straight edge band. I, I mean, I love the edge. I was I had my X-Watch on. So it did feel like, you know, that was part of who we were and what like, although we didn't, I guess we weren't that big lyrically into it. We weren't as straightforward about it. I mean, it was definitely our band. So it felt weird to have Charlie not be Edge. And I want to mm-hmm. just put it on Charlie because, I mean, it was Garth. It was, and eventually all of us except Jason. Um, but still at the time, yeah, I think he just, he was ready to move on. It just seemed to not make sense anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. I, and as you get older, like, now I, I never bought into the straight Edge thing. I was always kind of curious about drinking or or, you know, weed or whatever stuff you do when you're 17, 18. But, you know, I would see my straight edge friends one by one, like start drinking and stuff. And I I, per- I remember being at a bar with my friend who was edge forever till he was like 24. 
And then I saw him order a vodka tonic and my eyes like bulged. But then I was like, wait, don't make a big deal about it. So I would like go out of my way not to make a big deal about it. Cause like, I don't know. It's just, it's just changing, you know? Yeah, it is. But it's weird. And I mean, my, my wife, uh, Katie laughs at me now about it because like the period when I like sold out or lost my edge, I mean, it was emotional for me. Like I didn't even, it was more just like having the drink and like, okay, it's done. There wasn't like this, okay, now I'm just going to rage. Like I almost felt like I had to, yeah, I was putting a, a phase of my life to bed. Wow. Uh, that was an awesome one. But yeah. How old were you? 24. Ah, that's, that, that seems to be the age. Yeah, I, I, be, I eventually became straight edge, but by necessity. Ah, <laughs> yeah, Keith. Keith lost his partying card. He's yeah. just like he's he. Keith's well, dude. I'm so I'm glad I had it. You know, it was a great thing for me. It kept me out of trouble. I imagine seriously. Yeah, I so. had to tap out. I it was it became life or death. But you know what? It's all good. So and it, it's also good because like I went back and discovered a bunch of straight edge bands and had like a new appreciation for them. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah, man, I'm in this. Yeah. And like, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I know it's cliche, but it's like minor threat. That was kind of my like that was my brother and I's first like straight edge band. And like for that, you know, that that crystal first exposure moment, we keep talking about it. That really set up for me, though. That's so hardcore and almost was surprised when bands weren't straight edge. This is a this is a weird connection, and Pete, you do have a connection to this with skateboarding. But I always thought, like, when I got into straight edge, um, I always thought of it as like staying true to something that you really believed in and like something that you loved. So, like, I always thought about that with skateboarding. Like, when I was like straight edge and skateboarding, I was like, dude, I can't believe people quit skateboarding. Like, what the fuck, dude? Like, you either skate or you don't. Like. There's dudes at the like there's dudes at the park with us that are fucking 45 like that fucking still skate 3 times a week. Like this is either you're in or you're out and as you get older you realize like oh there's nuances to this. Like there's there's all different levels to it and people's lives take different trajectories and they they have different obligations and you're like oh okay I I get that but yeah I I definitely can empathize with that part of like when you do something and like or, or not do something and you step away from it, you're like, oh shit, this was such a huge part of my life. And now it's, now it's not like it's, it's definitely, um, it, it, it throws your perspective in, in another way that you're like, that's, that's definitely a different way to look at it. It's, it's hard because like, uh, I skateboarded from the time I was, when my mom got me a skateboard when I was six until I was, I don't know, 23 or 24. Like I skateboarded every day. Like I would literally just be like, all right, well, it's, if it's not raining, I'm going out and skating. I don't care if it's three degrees below zero. I'll put on long johns and fucking four jackets. Like I'll, when I fall, I won't feel it. But uh, I walked away from skateboarding for almost a decade. And uh, I've been watching like a bunch of videos in like the last like year or two with my daughter where I was, she would be like, what is that? And I'm like, oh, it's skateboarding. And she's like, I want to do that. And I'm like, I want to do that with you. <laughs> right. like, 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 let let's go. Like, let's get you aboard. Let's get you helmets. Like, let's get you pads. Let's let's fucking suit up and let's let's go skate. Like, and it's like what Keith was saying with that rediscovering of things that, like, you know, Keith, you're probably looking back at things like Judge and being like, wow, this is actually fucking. There's something resonating here. Like, there's something really cool with that. And uh, I, I do it now. Like my daughter like gets up in the morning, we get up really early. Cause like, we're trying to avoid people like being around people. So we go to the skate park at like six o'clock in the morning when the sun comes up and she's like, she's up at six and she's literally like jumping up and down. She's like, are we getting in the car now? And I'm like, yes, we are. I, like, and in my head, I'm going like, I, I need to, I need to make coffee. <laughs> Like, can you give me like 10 minutes? I need to stretch. <laughs> like, this is, this is, I'm, I'm almost 40 at this point. We gotta, we gotta chill out for a sec. <laughs> like, yeah. I've been so far disconnected from the skateboard. I think it still has the same qualities that it, that of like that you were saying like, you know, I'm dedicated to this. I'm gonna do it every day. And you'd even meet these older guys who are the same way. And it was sort of like this, this, um, true to skateboarding. It's the same with hardcore and maybe with straight edge that the personality types that maybe get into that are just, you know what I mean? They can get into to hardcore the same way or to straight edge or these certain things. It's like a lifestyle, I guess. It really, and it, it, it does. And it's like one of those things that like, uh, it, you see people that especially like that adopt straight edge for like, I know a, a handful of people that have, you know, continued with it on to, into their thirties and forties. And it's like, 
it is definitely a lifestyle choice that's like aesthetically it's like outward like they they put it out there like this is who i am and it's a part of what they identify themselves as so like you see people that have like you know um like the x tattoos on their hands i'm like fuck you're down for life dude right that's fucking crazy like that's a really that's deep commitment to this like the same way that like when i see dudes at the skate park that have like thrasher tattoos on their (laughs) neck i'm like fuck you guys are you you are fucking way more down than me because <laughs> like, if i roll my ankle today i'm out for, for <laughs> until i feel better like, i did get a secret edge tattoo when i uh when i took up the cause you know it, it, it's it, not an really? x but it you know that 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 the meaning t- kind of ties into that whole thing pete what what was Fair the enough. first drink you had do you remember Oh man, I I really don't. I wanted it was whatever the I think it was a beer of whatever was there. But it was in, I remember it was on the deck of the house that uh, I lived in with some roommates who had all already broken edge, except Casey Smith, who is still straight edge to this day. Shout out to Casey. Um, but yeah, they had something, and th- that was it. And I remember I got a text within like one minute from a friend saying, "Give me your X watch." <laughs> 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 and beer is hard to start with because I, I hated beer at first. You yes, know, I had to try yeah. like a bunch of them until I found one that I liked. I think that added to my uh, misery of like, what have I done? You know, traded yeah. it for this. <laughs> You're like yeah. cho- choking it down. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> this is what I broke this for. This is right, what everyone's right. making a big deal about? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so count me out's done. Edge is broken. So now we're moving into Renee H- Hartfelt. R- yes? Yeah. And it, Colin and I had really talked about doing the band because i mean we we were you know you drive in the van and play cds and play the music you're into and we were always i mean we obviously loved quicksand so that was an enormous i mean the whole band did everyone loves them but uh yeah that was definitely what we were rocking all the time and you have to go back to that time it was sort of a weird in between phase i think uh world's fastest car was always we were always listening to that yeah and um that was probably to me it was like well, all right we're going to do something like that and colin who i just love the way he played drums and also, you know, you're you're wanting to write songs and sing them. I was certainly anxious about that, kind of like how I'd be perceived, especially not yelling. Yeah. So feeling like I had some, some somebody who was like, "All right, I'll play with you, man." That was pretty cool. And it was Colin at first, and uh, so we had jammed on a couple of songs and ideas, which I guess would actually one of them ended up being on our like demo. So that started before we even went to Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, but long short of it, yeah, we broke up and then we started practicing in earnest. And that's when uh, Mike Stankovich came in, who played in Striking Distance in DC. He's mm-hmm. a guitar player. And he lived at Longfellow, which is Brian McTurnan, who recorded Texas is the Reasons for Seven Inch. I mean, yes. strike, strike Anywhere, you know him, like all these great yes. bands. He recorded out of that house. He recorded Count Me Out's first record there. Mm-hmm. So somehow he had moved out and moved in a bigger studio and Mike Stankovich had moved into that house with a bunch of other people and had a recording studio in his basement, which was really basic, but he had decent equipment and he actually knew how to do it for the most part. So somehow he had heard some demos I had. And I think I went up there and because he had a recording set up, he was like, do you want me to record you? I was like, for sure. Cause I was recording stuff out of my house and I drove up to DC and we sort of struck up a friendship and he was like, dude, I'll be in your band. So we started doing this, like we'd play in Richmond and then we'd drive up to DC and we had Charlie Flexen from County Out playing bass. So that was the beginning. It was Mike on guitar, me on guitar vocal, and then uh, Charlie on bass and Colin on drums. Yeah, I was going to ask about your influences. Now, Quicksand, Rival Schools, World's Fastest Car, all that stuff. I, I was in a band heavily influenced by quicksand as well and sometime around 2008 and i would always be showing the guys like renee hartfeld and memorial and i'd be like this man this is what we got (laughs) to do so so i was always pushing that so it makes sense that you know we had the same influences yeah i mean i guess it's no surprise there in terms of what they were but yeah i was definitely on a heavy definitely always listen to sunny day and texas the reason and uh trying to think what else was was really big for us um far Yes, uh, all that uh, stuff. That's it, man. Yeah. So you know, so yeah, that's kind of the, the vibe we were going for. And also at that time, there wasn't really that vibe. I right. Feel like no, there wasn't. You know, um, hardcore definitely broke in a direction that I was not really connecting with anymore. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of lost there. And then there was like this whole uh, 
man, what is the name? Like um, Panic at the Disco. But before them, who was it? Uh, uh, oh, like man. the Strokes or something? something well, like not that. even the Strokes, because we liked the Strokes. I remember God of that when they came out. That we thought that was cool as hell. But yeah. um, you know, like Panic at the Disco, that kind of emo sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were not feeling that. I hope we're not coming down. But like that was, I, it was like, <laughs> oh man, I. But I digress. We were kind of getting lumped into that sound anyway. So anyway, we wanted to start Renee Hartfeld to sort of like, dude, we want to do like a post hardcore band. Like these people, you know, a lot of, I feel like a lot of bands are maybe saying they were doing a post hardcore sound, but we really but had an not. idea what we wanted. Yeah. But not maybe. So that was the least that, all right, that's the direction I want to go. Yeah. And you know, I feel like today there's not a ton of true post hardcore bands in, uh, by my definition as well. Like there, there's nobody that sounds like Renee Hartfeld or Memorial as far as I know. One, uh, I guess there's a couple floating around, but I don't know. I feel like it's kind of a lost sound that I hope makes a big resurgence at some point. Yeah, same here. Uh, you know, I mean, in terms of like certainly Texas and all the, those bands were just oh, so good. It was such a great era of music. Whenever I like a band as much as Renee Hartfeld and Memorial, I always figure like they have to like the same exact stuff that I do. And, and you do. <laughs> so it makes sense that, you know, I like the end product of what you're doing too. Now, the, I got turned on to Renee Hartfeld. You opened for Walking Concert in Philly sometime in like 2004 or something. Yeah, and I remember that shit. Yeah, at the Kyber. And I, and I caught the tail end of the set and I was like, I'm like, these guys sound a lot like Quicksand. So, you know, the seed was planted. And then someone posted it online like months later and I was like, hey, this is awesome. So, you know, it was just, I was just instantly hooked. And you're one of the few people that saw us live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really funny when you go to like look up stuff on, I was trying to find, uh, like, I was like, let me just listen to stuff. Cause I, I, I work in my basement during the day. Like, I write math curriculum. So I'm sitting downstairs and I'm like, let me just put music on to listen to him. I'm like, oh wait, we're interviewing the dude from Renee Hartfelt. Let me just put stuff on. And it's easy to find some of your stuff on YouTube. But then I was like, wait, let me look up my more. Again with YouTube. Holy shit. I know. What? Well, yeah, chill out, dude. <laughs> no, this is this is a running joke with us. I'm just messing around. He hates that he he hates the fact that I won't buy Spotify, that I won't spring for Spotify, and that he sends me stuff constantly through Spotify, and then I just go and copy and paste it, and then put it in into YouTube, and then just find it on there. Because <laughs> I'm I'm too cheap to pay the thirteen dollars a year or whatever it is like, to fucking have it. So, but. I, I tried to, I was like looking up memorial stuff and it was so great. Like the comments under the videos are like, I got to see these guys live. And then like the, the person under is like, I'm yeah. so jealous. <laughs> like, fuck. So did <laughs> Renee, awesome. how long did Re- Renee Hardfeld play? And did you only play like in the, in the Northeast? No, actually we did a U.S. tour. Oh. Um, and it was at, right after we recorded um, the LP. Um, we did a summer U.S. tour. And it was on that? I couldn't. It was, it was a, I think, honestly, Eric Barr, who I think I actually call Eric Barr because he was Eric from Wilkes Barr, uh, was our agent. At, hilarious. Yeah, right? Um, I mean, there's so much backstory to some of how all that played out, but I would say that that was certainly like a, hey, I'm going to get you on these shows, some mm-hmm. of which will be hardcore shows, some of which were like legitimately, we, we did play a Shoney's. <laughs> like some of these just most random shows, but we played a couple of good gigs in California, but it was with a varying group. We did, we weren't on tour with anyone specifically, at least not the whole time. Um, you know, we played shows of one up. I think we started out with, and they were a cool band. Um, the distance who had like some connection with, with hate breed. And I think they had tried to do a sort of a major label push, which some bands were doing that, but, uh, it was not often we were playing by ourselves or just yeah one or one or two stints with one band and then switching it up. I was supposed to see you again. You were playing somewhere in Pennsylvania with my friend's band, but uh, I got too fucked up and I ended up not going to the show. <laughs> and and all too common story in my life up until about <laughs> three <it>. years ago. <laughs> we we have to Keith. We have to listen back to every episode and listen to. I was supposed to see you. All right, episode nineteen done. Oh, I could boy. just check it off because <laughs> yeah. it's like. It's just every time, like you're like, I was supposed to go see this band, or I did see this band, and yeah, then left the early. the story is always I was supposed to go and got too fucked up, or I was there and I don't remember any of it. Oh man, or I had to go meet I had to go meet a guy yeah, yeah, about yeah. a thing. Yeah, <laughs> and that 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 happened the one time I saw a Memorial in Philly. I I showed up to the show and made a big scene, 
And then I think I left like three songs in. That's a big oh. regret of mine. But more on that later. So oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> we're on Renee Hartfelt right now. And now, did you have problems? I seem to remember some controversy with that label, Textbook Music, I think it was. Did you have any problems with them or am I imagining that? No, I know that was totally... Totally. One of the big death knells of the band was, you know, surprise the label. And I think par- partially it was my eagerness to try to get something going because we had, we were on Lime Kiln Records for our little EP, which was really our demo. And they were super cool to us. And they were like, listen, we'll just, you know, we'll put it out. I think we played some, some, so, some shows with bands on the label. Um, and they were like, we'll just release it. And then, you know, whatever you want to do, which was great. And that's how textbook heard of us through Sean, this guy, Sean, who was kind of doing AR and he took an interest in our band um, and then pitched us to Andrea, who was a textbook for the LP. And we were just so eager to get an offer. We were so psyched. I mean, I really wanted to be on Revelation Records, but um, kind of knew that wasn't going to happen. And she was like, listen, I'll put you in the studio. We'll do this whole thing. And I mean, it was a huge, you know, the big talk with, I, I mean, hindsight being that I think she was like, just putting a seed out there. I'll release a record for you, put you in this deep, dark contract and hopefully sell it to a, another label that would want to pick you guys up as you develop. So, right. And it, I remember I actually sent the, the contract to an attorney yeah. and here I am, you know, working at a rap shop in a climbing gym yeah. and the attorney comes back to me <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's 800 bucks uh, for what I've just done. And all, all it was is the whole contract had read all over it, all over <laughs> it, man. It was like everything was wrong oh, with no. it. He's like, that'll be eight hundred dollars, and oh. we can go. From, we can go from here. And I really appreciate what he was doing, but you got like part of me thought, you know, we I don't really have much to stand on. I don't have a, we don't have a huge fan base. We don't have anything. We don't have a ton of momentum going for us. And they're willing to put us in the studio and record a record like an album. Yeah, uh, it's you know I want to say yes. <laughs> they're telling me everything I want to hear. So we didn't. I mean, we definitely had discussions about it. Uh, hindsight being twenty twenty, we should have waited. Uh, but yeah, we signed with him. So she immediately put us into the studio with Matt Squire, who we recorded the EP with. Mm-hmm. Because originally we wanted to record with Brian McTurnan. Yeah. Uh, but Brian was like, hey, I had this friend, Matt Squire, who'd be great for you guys. And so he recorded the EP. And then we got the money essentially to do the album from Textbook. And he had just finished recording Panic! of the Disco. Mm-hmm. Am I saying that right? Is that that band, Panic! of the Disco? Yeah. All right. Or there, there's an exclamation point. So maybe it's panic at the yeah, disco. Exactly. <laughs> I'll never forget rolling up to the, the first sessions for the album, the, for the, uh, the LP. And I think I have this right memory wise, but he was playing some of the mixes and he was, he was psyched on it. And I was like, I, I hated it. And it was like, <laughs> he, yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, nothing against I the guys. It's an incredible musician. And, and certainly the musicianship was coming through listening to it in the you know, studio speakers. But I was like, Oh, I couldn't be further from wanting to sound anything like this, you know? I've never heard them. I imagine a really dancey, like... just... Shit, yeah. I gotta look them up now. Hold on a second. Like, I don't know. Panic. Uh, Wait, you're doing this now? We're, we're, in, the, we're in the middle of something yeah, here, dude. Dude, hey, fucking post this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yo, that's... They got that... They have a big hit, dude. Yeah, they have a number of them. And now he sings with Taylor Swift. I think he was on. I think he was on Broadway singing for uh, Kinky Boots too. The guy, because I, I saw Subway ads for it. He's let's just put it this way. He's featured vocals on Into the Unknown from Frozen Two. Wow. Yeah, dude. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like that was like that was really bothering because like you guys were talking about like <laughs> this huge band. I'm like I don't fucking know who this is like so let's right. let's shift back to recording the now classic renee hartfeld lp death of the ghost now this is an album i come back to time and time again i was just telling tommy today like i could sit here and play the record from beginning to end just in my head like it's i think it's timeless and classic and i think it's right up there with all of the most classic post-hardcore lps what do you think about that pete wow uh that's Thank you. That's, that means, honestly, means a lot to hear that. I mean, because we didn't, uh, I didn't get a, a ton of, I mean, we, yeah, I guess we didn't get a lot of feedback on the record, or at least I don't remember. Uh, I think years later, people maybe appreciated it more than in the moment, or at least it felt that way to me. Yeah. So yeah, it feels great to hear that. And I mean, I don't know if I agree with you, but uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> now, I think it's crazy that you didn't get a lot of feedback. And I, 
I still now even I connect with it so much as a, you know, sad sack emo kid who struggled for much of his life and was just unhappy a lot of the time. You know, it was the perfect tone and all the influences that you mentioned are like all my favorite bands. And so I got to ask you a question. Now, I've I've always really loved the song Rush. Now, he, here's what I think it's about. And you tell me if I'm in the ballpark. Now, th- there's a troubled individual, maybe a friend of yours, possible drug problem. And they're, you know, as soon as they get money, it, it burns the hole right in their pocket, as you say in the song. And, you know, they're just always wandering around in trouble, lost soul. And you feel for this person. Am I close or spot on? I mean, yeah, I, I don't think that's a terribly uh, convoluted lyric. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry to me. And it's exactly what you're describing. I mean, I think it was just, it's funny because I don't even know, that was one of the songs that almost didn't make the record. Really? Yeah. We actually had a moment where we were going to really cut like four songs off that album. And that was one of them. Uh, the Lighthouse Man, too. <laughs> See, those are those are all hits. I'm glad you didn't. And I got to ask, are there Renee Hartfeld songs out there somewhere in the ether that did not make the albums? There is one song and we're doing, we're actually going to re-release the record on vinyl through 6131, which is cool. And it's coming out, I think, uh, Black Friday this year. So it will have, I think, someone, it'll have one on the, one studio track unreleased. I think there was only one and it's just some other random stuff. Should be cool. That is really exciting because I'm, I'm just always hungry somehow for more from Renee Hardfeld or Memorial. I'm like, God, I hope they somehow play again. Or there's a song out there that I don't know. Like I was even asking people on the on the Instagram, I was like, does anyone know Pete? Like, are there any songs we haven't heard yet? <laughs> I need more. Oh, man. I, I will say, I, uh, uh, tragically, I, the classic story, I uh, had a hard drive with a ton of stuff. And sort of Renee's next half of her record, which some of which became Immortal, but all lost. So a ton of music disappeared there, but probably none of which you'd really want to hear. I think you'll, you know, uh, the, the unreleased track that, Renee had was cool. I think mean, there was a reason it was unreleased, but it was still, it's cool. I think a, a fan maybe like you would will appreciate it. But yeah, I'm psyched to hear you say that. Yeah, man, it's it's just great music. It always reminds me of like fall and just, you know, mid-20s, getting into trouble, figuring shit out. You know, it's just, it's just like the soundtrack for me. Man, that's awesome that you connect that way to it because it really does come from that place. Like it, everything you're just describing. Yeah, and that's why that's why I love to know like, what's going on behind these records because you know like i was mentioning earlier i'm I'm like if i connect this much with it it has to be touching on that so that's why i like to hear like what went into the record or what were the influences and oftentimes you know the the connections are there it's the same influences it's the same feelings and so it makes sense that i'm that i connect that much with it well i was just gonna say pete are you having the uh tropical storm coming through you yeah actually it's raining right now man yeah that's Uh. what Okay, so it's supposed to be in Philadelphia tomorrow morning around 5 a.m. And I actually, I mentioned it to Keith on the, like, we were starting this. I was like, uh, I hope he's not having any problems. My my stepsister lives in Virginia Beach. That would make sense right now that that could be going on. It, it's probably my internet. I, I texted her and I was like, how is it? And she's like, it's a mess down here. She's like, we took everything in. She took, we, she's like, we took everything in from outside, like all the garbage cans, all the patio furniture, like everything's locked up. They said the wind's going to be really bad. And I was like, oh, I hope this does not affect Pete tonight. Well, it's crazy if it did, because honestly, our first show, Renee Hart's first show was, I think it was September 21st, 2003, right two days, three days after Hurricane Isabel. Well, that came through and just wrecked Richmond. There was no power. I thought the show was going to be canceled. And they played, we had the show, they ran a generator. Oh, my (laughs) God. And like a really limited setup. And we played. It was pretty wild. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad I got to see the band once. I remember a very tiny bit of it, which is better than none. But, you know, it was a very long time ago. (laughs) So, so why did the band end? I think, I mean, one thing was so we've, we started, we did the LP, we went on tour, we did a summer tour right after that LP. And of course, I, you know, our main stomping ground was the Northeast, playing like Philly, Wilkes Bar. Uh, we played some New York shows, Connecticut, Maryland, stuff like that. Um, but we went on this US tour right after recording. I do think, honestly, like the early mixes, I, I don't know if the band was fully coming around to it yet, like as a 
whole. I think some of the songs they were, I mean, I think that they were psyched on it, but from my memory, there was some hesitation about the whole album as a whole, like, like those songs, like some of the not so heavy songs, like right. what direction are we going? What is this? Um, and then we're playing these, this tour and we had a booking agent. Finally, we were psyched about, uh, but it was just booking us on shows that really weren't getting us anywhere. I mean, we're getting experience, but we certainly weren't playing to a crowd that was really going to hear our sound, you know? Mm-hmm. So morale was low, lo- long short of it. And then we, we came back, played some more shows, and then I had gotten into dental school. It was sort of like, hey, we could either do this part-time like we'd been doing it, where we do kind of summers and breaks. Um, but the band was not hearing that. They wanted to do something full-time. So it was sort of like, man, we just can't do this if we're going to do it part-time. On top of that, we had the issue with uh, uh, textbook. She had just sort of lost her mind. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to speak ill poorly about her, but I just, from a standpoint of our band, she sort of promised the world. We were skeptical to begin with with that. And we kind of knew that wasn't going to play out like she said it was. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, she was like, you know, at the time, hey, we're on, we're on tour. We're gonna, I'm going to make sure we get your al- your record in, the, in at least one or two stores in the towns you're playing. Because at the time, we were right at that transition where that mattered. And um, sure enough, she never did. So we were always playing towns where no one even knew anything about us or had never heard of us. We didn't really have any internet presence. We were just kind of spinning our wheels. And then at the same time, like, Revelation Records was somewhat like, hey, we'd be interested maybe in working with you guys. And we talked to Andrea about this. And she was like, no, you know, only if they, you know, buy out the full contract and all this ridiculousness that was never going to happen. Oh. Um, so it just started being like, okay, you you can't go anywhere. I'm not going to give you any more money. I'm not going to promote you at all. Um, so we were dead in the water, man. You like just we locked couldn't, in. Oh. We were locked in. So that plus dental school, I think was it. And I think we played... I don't remember when I, we played our last show. Um, I think it was like around February of 06. Did you have a lot of feelings to process because of that? Like, I mean, I can me at that age, I would have been like, fuck, man, we could have been, maybe been on Revelation. And <laughs> this didn't happen and that didn't happen. And God damn it. Did you go through any of that? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, believe me, man. I mean, I had put, if nothing else, Renee Hartfelt was a, an exercise in absolute persistence. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't come out of the hardcore band like a great singer or a great like a particularly great guitarist or anything i just wanted to do this sound so bad i wanted to be in a band so bad and play the music and write these lyrics that i was doing i just was determined so yeah you know what man i was beyond frustrated um also we had been really you know the grind of that u.s tour was still fun but it was just sort of (laughs) dream crushing and like wow this is going to be a long road and it seems like we don't have any of the connections. And at, at that same time, like Mike Stankovich, who had started the band with us, had gone off. He quit the band to go play. Um, I think it was like the last of the famous, all these Morrissey references, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was supposed to be like an all-star band uh, with some members of other bigger bands. And it seemed like all around us, people like were taking off American nightmare. Um, all these different bands and it seemed like they always had some sort of edge. They knew someone yada, yada. And it just seemed like we were in the worst position ever and it just was falling flat. So yeah, we sort of never played a last show or really that official about it. I think probably because I was so despondent about it. I didn't really want to totally kill it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, but, uh, yeah, I was pretty I was pretty broken up about it, man. Yeah, uh, Revelation would have been the perfect fit. So it's it's unfortunate that didn't happen. I mean, that that's it when I I mean, you've got that Revelation sound. And you know, it's all I think it's all about perspective, Pete, because like, you know, you say like you weren't sure about your voice or the band and I I literally used to show people like your records and be like, "I want to sing like this. I want to <laughs> write songs like this, and I can't do it." Like <laughs> Oh, so it's well. all about perspective. Yeah, I guess you're right. So how does Memorial start up? So towards the end of Renee Hartfelt, I had joined this band called The Silent Type. Mm-hmm. And they were a Richmond band. And this guy, Nathan, Nathan Altice, fronted that band. This guy, Nick Wurz, played guitar for them. And they were really good musicians and wrote this super cool, sonic, totally different sound, quiet. Some of it was like acoustic-y, um, totally different vibe. Anyway, they they... I was really good friends with their drummer who originally sang for balance. The first band I was in that got me into count me out. Mm-hmm. He now played drums for this band in silent type. And, um, 
he moved in next door to this kind of apartment I was living with a bunch of friends of mine. So we were kind of in the salad days. It was like, oh, what, oh, five, oh, six. And um, I was starting starting dental school. And then I joined the silent type and Jared was the drummer. And all of a sudden, Jared and I headed off and we were starting to rehearse together. And I still had some Renee Heartfelt ideas yeah. and like still had that vibe that I wanted to go for. Um, and all of a sudden we had started a band and that, that was Memorial. And that must have been, I think, 08. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it just seemed like a logical progression. It's like the more refined version of Renee Hartfelt. The sound wasn't completely different, but it was trying out some new things. And, and of course it's excellent. Well, thank you. It was cool. And we met this guy, Chris Dowen. Oh, I shouldn't say met. We knew him, but I met, I really got to know Chris through the silent type and sort of that circle of friends and musicians. And he's another incredible musician and had really good abilities recording and at equipment. And it also worked at a studio. So all of a sudden we had a, a way in to get something recorded and we could go in and work with him. And he, you know, he had a great musical sense. So he could sort of produce us too, like get us through the session. Mm -hmm. And um, that really worked out well. And he ended up recording the first split seven inch, which again, we had a seven inch to kind of tell almost like the demo for the van. And we we're like, all right, this is cool. We want to do another one and we'll record, you know, release it as two separate seven inches because we thought the EP was just more digestible and it'd be easier to find somebody willing to do the EP. And yeah. again, I'd been talking with revelation records and they were like, yeah, we'd be into it. And of course, Andrea from textbook caught wind of it. She was like, hell no, you can't oh, do man. it. She came back from the dead. Believe me, man, it was horrible. So even though you're under a new band name, even though it's under a new band name. Oh, oh, so, so, and I mean, again, what are you fighting over? Like the sale of like, you know, a hundred records. Like anyway, it was, but Revelation didn't want to touch it, so they said, never mind. Wow. So we ended up having to release it on a smaller label that was like, yeah, we'll do it, and we released it as one record. Yeah, and that's the creative process Berlin. That's right. And yeah, and I, I, was, I loved it right away because the first song sounds like Phaser. Were, were you oh, influenced yes. by that? Yeah. I mean, to some, yeah. I mean, it's hard to, even at that point, it was weird because I still wanted that sound. I don't know what I was going, what we were going for as a band, but, um, and I mean, embarrassingly, I don't even have a copy of that record. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like it, through the moves, you know, I had a couple of moves and it's just a weird time, you know, in your twenties in your life. And I, I totally tend to hold on to stuff like that, but managed to not have any of it. So, um, some of this is off bad memory here. I moved four times in a year span, like a couple years ago. And so I, I basically have nothing but amplifiers and a television <laughs> and a PlayStation 4 now. <laughs> that's stuff that matters, right? We've talked about this before on the podcast, but it's like one of those things like I'm the worst person to start an Instagram account with, with like where we're supposed to be posting memories from back then because I literally like every three to five years just jettison everything. I'm like, fuck this. Let's throw this. I, I throw everything out <laughs> and... It's now like gotten to the point where like um, <laughs> a friend dropped off a ton of old show flyers and I'm like, OK, take care of these, put them in order, make sure I have them in a the right place, make sure they're safe, like make sure I'm taking like because Keith texted me the other day and was like, hey, we need stuff for uh, this one post. And I was like, oh, I have those in a safe place in my <laughs> <laughs> those are all filed in my basement they're ready to go like whereas like before everything i had was just like fucking th I, I was like i don't want this what, the fuck are, what am i gonna do with a cave in flyer from 99 like that's just threw it out <laughs> like one man's trash is another man's treasure you know i'm surprised i'm surprised i held on to the number of flyers and ticket stubs and stuff that i did because you know i'm like wow this this stuff must be important to me Keith, I remember sleeping you one night. I went uh, out in the city with you and Doug, and I slept in your bed because you're like, I'm not going to bed. I was like, all right, well, can, I, can I can I use your can I use your bed? You're like, yeah, of course. And I went and slept in your room, and I remember going to bed in your room, and you had, um, oh god, what what did you you have a you had a flyer on your wall that was like ink and dagger and somebody else, and I was like holy shit like that i yeah. remember like i i've seen that before i was like that's fucking insane like he kept that from 10 years ago and that was 15 years ago I was like, jesus christ it was a flyer for their last show ever that never actually happened i oh. think they i think they advertised more than one like last show ever 
Uh, but <laughs> I, I just remember before I turned the lights out, I was like, oh, shit, he kept that? That was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> So M- Memorial. Now, yes, another band I come I come back to all the time. I got to tell you, Pete, I'm I'm really going to prop you up here during this discussion, but Beyond the Beyonds. Now, that is just one of the best songs ever. It's a song I come back to all the time and I just again, lyrically I always really connect with it and the whole uh even if I told you everything, it wouldn't be half as cool. That's like that's, oh. like, that's like a little slogan for me. <laughs> Cool, man. That, that means a lot. I, I appreciate, uh, yeah, I remember writing that song and I, I love that song a lot too. And I'm glad you connected with it, man. That's cool. Yeah. It's like, it's like the perfect blend of like chill and then it picks up a little bit. And I, I, on that record, I, I love, and I don't know, like, I guess I, I was playing it the other day and my daughter heard it and she was like, I like that guy's voice, uh, beneath. Cause it has that like acoustic intro. Yeah. And yeah. she was, she was like, that's a really nice sound. I like that. And I was like, all right, well, there's another song to learn. <laughs> at least it's not Disney this time. <laughs> like, at least oh, it's something cool. something a little bit more in my wheelhouse. This would be great. <laughs> oh, we're we're getting real nerdy, but what what are the tunings? Because I've I've tried to learn like some of the songs before and I I can like is it in B? Is it in D? I can't tell. Oh, no, it's just it's just flat at a half step and then you'll see how simple everything is. And we often do drop D. We often do drop D, but we'll right, we tune to D sharp or so like uh, beneath is in so that's e just it's just e flat right right exactly okay cool all right the, no every I string think every string down a half half step and you'll be able to play along with all of it with basic <laughs> very simple bar chords and all that stuff I was gonna say I I think I figured out the first part and I was like oh all right I got this like it's actually yeah. really funny it's uh it's some of the same chords I can't remember the name of the band but they had like a uh it was like they had like a hit in like the early 90s and i don't remember the name of the band but it's the same chords they use for one of their songs and i was like wait a minute i think they just oh used- yeah <laughs> Co- collective soul collective soul it's the fucking thing yeah, dude it it's is, exactly. right. thank you in fact, that's awesome because we used to, we used to play that song we used to play that when we'd be like rehearsing so that's awesome <laughs> oh my god so wait Pete, i'm right like yes yeah. this- yes no <laughs> tommy i'm glad you mentioned this because now that that song i wrote that song before i years before i ever heard the memorial song it was the same song and i loved it i was like this is awesome and i would go to parties and play it and someone's like that's fucking collective soul and then i got and then i got bummed out and stopped playing it and then i heard the same song on the memorial record and i was like motherfucker i shouldn't have listened to people it's awesome the worst part is, is like it's the same chords to a Dave Matthews song too. There's yeah. a Dave, there's a Dave Matthews band song that's that's able to play like that. I don't, I don't know the name of it, but like I remember playing it one. I I played that Collective Soul song one time, and somebody's like, "Yeah, it's the same chords for uh, you know whatever Dave Matthews band song that is." Right, anytime you're walking up the major scale, right, you're gonna find you're gonna run into a couple of songs. But it's just it, it, it's such a great song, and there's there's a lyric in there, and I it I can't believe it, it escapes me right now, but it's like. Spend time when you can, because when this all ends, there'll be nothing and there'll be no one left to blame. And I'm like, fuck, man, that resonates so hard. Like, it's, yes. it, there, there's this. It, it's it's the way because it it transitions from like the acoustic part into the part where like there's a, a slight distortion on the guitars to part where it's like super heavy. And yeah. it's just that transition from the acoustic to that part. And it's just your vocals. It's just it's fucking haunting, man. Oh man, I'm glad you did that. I have to give a lot of credit to to uh, to Chris Dallin who recorded that. And I remember that session because we, you know, I had the song and I was playing it acoustic for the band. We kind of recorded it acoustic, and then we were, I mean, we had rehearsed a lot of different parts with it, um, but trying to get it to work, you know, recorded. That's the art of it, right? And he sort of figured out how to what the the sound had to be. Um, so I'm glad that connected, man, because. That was weird. In a lot of ways, the lyrics from the first, because that was Berlin, um, was sort of informed by uh, one of the last songs on uh, Death, Death of the Ghost. In that I was kind of like trying to write from a third person, like not necessarily about myself. Yeah. Um, but trying to look at like, yeah, motif or something like that. And I was just really inspired by the Korean War, not in like good way. But I think that was part of why we called ourselves Memorial. And sort of seeing what was happening with, you know, just doing the same thing as America does. We go and, you know, 
start some foreign war and then a bunch of young men die, you know, not to get heavy on that, but I think that was sort of where that song was going from. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, time and time again, like the lyrics and just everything really touched me. And that's why I go back to the music all the time. And Getting heavy is okay because we do that a lot on this show. We really get it. We really get into the shit. It's funny. I was just gonna say I didn't want to get super heavy with this, but that was one of the things that uh, predicated my father's death was his involvement in Vietnam. Was he got pancreatic cancer from being exposed to Agent Orange? Oh, and, brutal! You know, like he was a a twenty one year old kid sent to you know twelve thousand miles away to a country he's basically had no exposure to, and to be like, yeah, we're gonna make sure there's democracy here, and it's like. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had no idea that's what it was from. Yeah, no, it's actually uh without getting into like really like crazy details about it, but um uh my mother was part of a class action lawsuit that uh sued uh not only the United States government but the chemical manufacturer and Oh good. Uh, yeah, so Did she my, get some cash from that? She did get a monthly payout until I turned 18. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, they actually did like a whole. It's a it's a weird uh, death calculus that they do. Um, they figured out that because my father had uh, before he passed away, my father had uh, was four credits away from finishing his PhD, oh. and he was in the middle of it, like getting his doctoral stuff to, together. And so they do a uh, lifetime earning potential. It's mm. so awful to go through these documents. It's one of these things that like my mom was like, hey, I. I have all this stuff left over from when your father was alive. Do you want to look at it? And then, of course, like me being like the dork that I am, I sat down and like started pouring over it. And then the next thing you know, I'm like reading this stuff going like, holy shit, like this is my life in a nutshell. Like this is literally paperwork that documents all this. But yeah, they do a lifetime earning potential and essentially they break it down into monthly payments. Yeah, it's scary, dude. It's it's just and it's it's the same thing that like I I was scrolling through Instagram the other day and a thing came up that said, you know, uh, were you part of the U S military? Do you have hearing damage from three M because they didn't have, uh, I guess the proper hearing protection or they were told it was proper hearing protection. And now there's people that have, uh, like tinnitus and all these different, um, inner ear problems because of hearing damage they were exposed to in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's like, fuck dude, like <laughs> the 18 year old fucking kids, like going over to a foreign country and then you have, lifetime of you know problems that go along with it it's just it's 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 devastating so memorial now i did catch them live once but it was in 2008 i think at a house show in south philly but it was like my birthday weekend so i drank half a bottle of vodka before i even got there i was like a the tasmanian devil at that place and then i <laughs> I, I like you know roared out of there like i don't know during your second song and it's a big regret of mine I was just to say, I, I do remember playing Philly. Uh, I think I actually remember playing a a, a a basement show. That was it, yeah. But Did Memorial play out a lot? I feel like you guys weren't together incredibly long. No, we really weren't. I mean, only like two years, two or three years. So, And we didn't we didn't play a ton. I couldn't even tell you how many times we did play. We probably only did half dozen kind of weekend jaunts northeast. That's it. And I have to ask, besides the Great Lakes, is there any... Uh, hidden memorial material out there waiting to be unearthed? You know, maybe I'd reached out to Chris Dowen, who has a lot of the rough mixes and recordings, and I, because I don't remember, but I'm sure that there are probably at least one or two tracks that were recorded and not released and not, you know, mixed or, but to get those would be challenging because, I mean, you know, he's, he's got a full life now and I, it's, it's a lot to think, all right, look, you know, pull up this, what, eight, seven or eight year old, no longer than that. Uh, 12 year old recording. I mean, with, uh, I don't even know how I'd get it into a session. And so long short of his, maybe, maybe <laughs> just tell him Keith from the Northeast scene really wants to hear it. I got this one guy. I got this one guy. <laughs> Remember, uh, Keith, <laughs> you, I actually just did it. I just said member, Remember? uh, <laughs> Keith, do you, uh, that guy, that's a big fan of the show. Um, Ed, the, the dude, the BMX guy, yeah. Ed, he, he, he texted Keith and was like, Hey, I saw you guys posted something about a local band that we uh, used to play a lot with called Heinous Anus. And he's like, does anybody have this, the, the five song EP? And I was like, I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I had it on an old hard drive at my house. It took me like three hours to get it off there. But like, I was like, oh, dude, if somebody wants this stuff and I have it, I'm fucking I'm, I'm tr I'll make an effort at least to try to get it out there. 
Yeah, <laughs> we're like, you know, we're like the centerpiece for Bucks County hardcore and demos and, you know, like everything's moving through us now. A couple people requested that demo, actually, so. Is that what it was? I'm sorry. I, yeah. I just, I really just remember Ed asking for it and being like, uh, maybe. <laughs> no, one other, one other person asked for it, too. So, how, how does Memorial come to an end, Pete? So, I, I guess we had gone... We had done that, that album had been released. We played some shows and then I was still writing music, but I was getting kind of deeper and deeper into this new career of dentistry and still in school and also wanting to move to the West coast. So that was like goal number one. And I knew in order to get out there, dentistry being sort of the kind of closet industry, it's a little bit of a, uh, you know, you know, someone sort of thing. It's still a really small, intimate thing. I knew I had to like do a program or a residency or something to get to know some dentists out if I was going to actually be a dentist. So I applied to go to, to do a residency program at UCLA. Um, and we were, this was before we even cut um, Mile High City. But I actually remember I was recording vocals and it was only two blocks from my apartment. Um, so I could walk, you know, after school, go to my apartment and then that evening go over to the studio and record. And we only did this for like a week or two, but, um, I got my acceptance letter and we hadn't even finished a record yet. So I kind of knew, I was like, oh, this, this is going to be tough. Now it was only, you know, I knew maybe it wouldn't be for forever. Although part of me wished, was hoping it was going to be. So it was just a tough situation to be in, but I really loved the songs. I loved the band. I wanted to keep doing it, but I kind of was on this path. So basically when I left, uh, cause I, I want to say we recorded that in May. I, I, I'm not certain. And then I, I graduated and then left that August, uh, to go out to LA and that was it just by sheer the distance, you know? Yeah. And I, I remember when you guys released the opener as like a preview for the EP and I was obsessed with that song. Like I was like, this is the best song ever. It became synonymous with me. Like I would get in someone's car and they would just put it on and I'd be like, yeah, that's right. Oh, dude, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I'm glad you dug that song because we were proud of that song. I love that song too. I mean, um, and I felt like we had sort of, that with that record sort of found our sound. Yes. I feel like both Renee Hartfeld and Memorial were like short-lived. It's just one of those bands where I'm like, God, like more people really need to know about these guys. And I'm like, Hungry for more in the same way that like back in the day, Texas is the reason only had like the EP and the LP and it be, like it became this legend. You know what I mean? There was like no more music, no more anything. And I'm like, no, there, there just needs to be more. Right. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I think there was some definitely some impatience there. Yeah. Uh, and with the stress of school, too, that was the same with Renee Hartfelt is that I can't deny that that put a lot of pressure self-imposed to some extent. Mm -hmm. on man we've got to do something to sort of convince me to walk away from this other thing that i'm passionate about yeah um you know to really take it because as we all know it's it's a huge gamble to just put everything on the line to be in a band yes um and and also as you know like it, it come home and work two jobs and do all this stuff to actually make ends meet it's just a lot of emotional and physical effort which is awesome and worth every moment but yeah, at a certain point, I was, what, 20, almost 29, I guess, 29. I was like, all right, I got to do this thing. Right. So. Did you ever think, like, maybe I'll just try to do music full time? Yeah, for sure. And when I graduated from college, I got out and I was, I wanted to really, that's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to see another library. I was over it. Mm -hmm. So certainly, and then going out on tour, and I mean, I'd done it with Count Me Out and seen sort of that really shoestring budget sleeping right in the van on couches, which most bands do. That's how you do it. Yeah. Um, and I liked it then. And then with Renee sort of started seeing some of the grind of it of like, wow, here we are again doing the same thing. And I think if the shows had been somewhat better, I probably would have been more committed, but mm -hmm. we just were not happy. I mean, we had some good gigs for sure, but overall it was, it was tough. I mean, there wasn't a lot of positive feedback on the band, you know? Yeah, which seems crazy to me because, like, it's everything I wanted in a band. It's like the band I imagined that I wanted to be in. And, you know, that that's something I struggled with a lot. Like, I wanted to do music full time, but every band I ended up in was like, just no one cared or it, it wasn't the right sound or I wasn't totally crazy about it or it ended. Like, there was always a problem. I never got to the point where, like, we would get signed or go on tour. So 
I almost never had to make that decision. I wanted to do it full time, but it just it just kind of never worked out. Plus, because of my upbringing, like I'm kind of obsessed with having security, and you know, like I I don't want any credit card debt. I don't. I have to know that I'm going to be able to afford things. You know what I mean? I need like、oh, Keith. I come from the same place, man. Believe me, I come from the same place of like I'm not trying to yeah run up credit. And and a lot of people in bands did that. And then that seemed to me like insanity. I did that too. I was like tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt from just being a, a complete degenerate. But that <laughs> that's that's all been handled. I've I've got a handle on things now, which I'm happy about. And you know, I I thought about it a lot when I turned thirty, and I don't know, even now sometimes, because I have friends like you know they they're in multiple bands, they tour, they tour Europe, like they all work at a bar together. It just seems really awesome. Like they kind of just do whatever they want, and they you know they. Kind of call their own shots, and I'm like that. That seems like a pretty fucking fun life. Indeed, I mean, certainly that side of it, but also I'm sure, as you know, and having played shows and stuff, that there is that like you get that one hour moment of what you want, which is to play and con- connect and share the art and all that, and the rest of it is a grind. And especially when you're a band coming up, you know, I mean, yeah, you're hanging out with your friends and all that stuff is good, but. You know, once you're you've kind of done a couple of tours of that, and that's maybe lost some of the novelty. It's now all right. What am I doing all day here in this town when I have no money? Yeah. So yeah. you're right. I'm gonna read this book or just sit around or get in a fight with my bandmate because we're bored. Yeah. Right. And then you know, so I, it was good to at least see that aspect of it. And I think it's well balanced if you're the band is making strides, it's making progress. Right. You're connecting more people. You're growing. Yes, you know, you're st- all of a sudden, yeah, you're still feeling creative, and that was still there. But I think that overall, it was just, it was hard, man. I was having, I was having trouble on the road, with yeah, just feeling like, man, no one is hearing what we're doing, no one cares. We're playing a show, and no one's paying attention. I find that crazy, but yeah, that's the thing. It's like you said, it's a young man's game. If I was like twenty years old, I might consider it now. But I mean, I'm thirty eight now.、Uh, I've got a girlfriend who's got a kid. We're Talking about moving in together, we've got two cat children. I mean, that's it. I'm happy. That's good living too, man. And then that's a great thing, is it? You know, there's phases, right? Yeah.、Um, and I think also, had I maybe been where it was like, hey, we're just going to continue to do this for fun, I think we would have, because we were still enjoying it to that level. But I think the pressure of wanting to make it, hey, I want to do this as a career. Like, how can we get on a bigger label? How can we figure out? Because we were also transitioning into social media and MySpace. And how、yep. to promote? And we got caught in a couple of those where it would be like this band was huge online. Like they had all these. I don't even know what it was back then. It wasn't likes, but there was some evidence that this band has lots of watches or views or fans. Yeah. And we're going to play a show with them, and you guys are going to open for them. And we're like, excellent. You know, we go, and it was like internet hype. There'd be like fifteen people there. We drove <laughs> eight hours. You know, and it's. Uh, and it, w- it was kind of watching that sort of develop, where it used to be, you know, the the demo tape or demo CD, and it was a bit more organic in that way. And I think、yeah. we were a bit like, "Whoa, we don't even know how to do this, like how to promote ourselves in this new environment." It was changing so quick, right?、Um, all those things kind of factored into it, right? So you're you're out in LA, you're in dentistry school there, right? Well, no, I was in Venice Beach, and.、Um, Um, I've always loved surfing, so the goal was sort of to arrive in Venice Beach, really focus on the program and learning the trade and doing dentistry, the art of it,、um, a bit like the aesthetics and some of the implant dentistry and some of this other stuff, sedation. So I, additional skills that I needed. So I was definitely hyper focused on that. But I was also at that point of、um, I'd been doing bands as my main hobby, main expenditure, main time suck, so to speak. Since I was a seventeen, like really, with count me out, and even before that, with the nuns, I mean, it was still like all I cared about. I stopped skateboarding. I just wanted to play music.、Mm-hmm. So I think I'd reached a point where I kind of wanted something different. I wanted to just not be in a band. <laughs> yeah, which sounds weird, but I wanted. So I, I really just played a lot of music by myself,、um, and、uh, went surfing with, my, with Kong, who actually name dropped in one of the songs on the record. Oh,、um, nice. Yeah, you may recognize, but、uh, he was my still my good friend to this day. But、um, he was already living out there with his girlfriend and now wife, and、mm-hmm. they're actually expecting their second child. But they were so he kind of received me in Virginia Beach, 
and we went surfing. Uh, our buddy Tim was also out there who, who we grew up with in Richmond. So I kind of, it was almost like instant switch, new lifestyle, no music. Yeah. Right. Um, I got obsessed with flying RC helicopters. <laughs> How did it feel like not playing in bands anymore? Were you happy? Did you miss it? You know, I, I had enough new experiences happening when I was out there. I didn't, I was certainly writing a ton of music and playing a lot of guitar, but none yeah. of it was sticking. I was sort of just like, ah, I don't know what I'm doing with this. I'm just kind of expressing myself and then leaving it. I'm not even trying to finish a song or have that whole issue of trying to write a, write a, a song that you're going to now bring to the band, right? Which had always been my thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing I did is I played a comedy club <laughs> with these two, a girl and a guy that I had known through a friend of a friend somehow. And they're like, hey, we need a guitar player for this skit. Mm -hmm. So they did some cheesy rap and they needed me <laughs> to like play some sort of beat rhythm. And that's all the only time I performed the whole time I was out there. And really since that's it, I've not played live since uh, uh, Memorial broke up. You know what though? I think that there's something to be said for that kind of idea of like looking at the past as the past and just leaving it for what it is. And I think like when you said you found like new interests, right? Like, so you found like RC helicopters and surfing and like it, when you see those types of things as a way to occupy your time and a way to make you happy. Like that's, I, I think the thing is, is that a, a lot of times we look at things and look at it as like, Oh, we have to get something from this. Like there has to be some type of end product to some type of result, something we can show to other people. And it's like, just be in the process. Just be okay with having fun with what you're doing or learning something new. Like I, I, it's, it, especially if it's something you enjoy, like, there's nothing better than getting new in like getting into something that's new and sucking at it and then being like, Oh, I can see like a little bit, like some success from this. Or like, I see a little bit of like mastery of whatever concept of it is. Like it, it's just, it's very fun. Like I, I can totally empathize with that. Like where I look at like, like Keith and I bring this up fairly often on the podcast of like putting our guitar down for months at a time. Like, all right, I just I'm not playing guitar now. Yeah, I think I'm done with music. Uh, well, you know what? I say that now, but uh, yeah, I I feel you, Pete, on that. Like, and the developing new interests. Like, I always had interests, but I was just always too afraid or too fucked up to pursue them. Like, you know, my my life got very small, and I completely isolated from everyone, and I was just getting messed up and not leaving the house. And I got through that, and thankfully, I survived. So then I had all this energy and this motivation to do things I wanted to do. I'm like, I've always wanted to front a band. I want it to sound like this. I'm going to do that. And I was like, this is going to be what I am. The band's going to be huge. I'm going to be a band guy now. And I got to put out the record, but the band quickly dissolved. And I was like, fuck, what, what am I going to do? But at the same time, I was taking an acting class. So then the acting class is going to do a production and I get the lead. And that was my life for a year. And then, you know, Tommy and I put together the instagram account and i'm like yo if we get to a thousand followers we're gonna do a podcast and i had no i didn't even consider ever doing a podcast but like you know i heard some other podcasts and i'm like fuck if those guys can do it we can do it and now it's all come full circle because like in my youth i was always like oh wrong band wrong time you know why aren't i in renee hartfelt why why aren't i playing with renee hartfelt why this why that and now we get to do this thing and talk to all the artists we love. And it's just, it's all full circle. And I just think it's really cool. That is cool, man. I mean, it's a great way to realize it exactly all, all on, on its own time. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. you really try to force it. You just want it now or want, but uh, yeah, you, I don't know. I, maybe I learned that for somewhat from Renee. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I used to just get so hung up on the idea like, no, like my life has to be this rather than looking at like what it is. And, you know, I now I can go all the way back to my youth. I'm like, shit, when I was 10 years old, like I, I had like four different talk shows I would record by myself, like on cassette tapes, you know, as different characters. And I'm like, oh, like I'm just going back to what I was doing. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny actually. I, I mentioned the RC helicopters. Is that I, I grew when I was in Chicago and we discovered skateboarding through this shop called Tom Thumb. It was a half hobby shop that did plastic models, RC planes, and all that stuff. And it was half skate shop. And they were one of the hugest distributors for uh, our biggest distributors for skateboards in the Midwest. So everything was coming through there. 
Um, but long short of it is that I was, we we're building plastic models, building RC cars when we were kids. And that's, and then we got introduced to skateboarding. So it was weird that later on, sort of after doing this band thing, yeah, I got back into flight and then actually subsequently got my pilot's license um, as sort of like an old passion that I'd hung up. Yeah. So taking out the music and the time and maybe emotional energy opened up some other paths, although I still miss it. I mean, for sure. Yeah, I would. I I really like the EP my band put out two years ago, and I we never got to play a show because the band kind of fell apart. But I mostly wrote everything, so I would like to do it at some point. Uh, but just you know, no one can do anything right now, so I'm not really worried too worried about it. But I mean, at least you did it, right? I mean, you wrote the songs and you recorded them, and and in the end of the day, I mean, it really it's again cliche, but you know, you're making the art, you're doing the thing. I think that's what matters. So how did you end up back in Virginia? Well, I, I, originally the grand plan as it goes, right? I was going to work somewhere in California, but uh, sort of getting a feel. And as I graduated, was about to leave, the uh, kind of graduate from the program, I was looking at, I was interviewing at jobs and I just wasn't liking what I was finding from a standpoint. It just was going to be a hour and a half commute each way. Cause I did want to live close to the beach. I didn't want to move in like the inland empire or whatever, but mm-hmm. realizing that probably I was going to have to do something like that where I was going to really have to grind it out for another five years, you know, to maybe buy into a practice and really commit myself to the West coast. And it's awesome, but so expensive. And then as a dentist, you, know, you got to buy into the business. So all of a sudden now I got a bank loan. So I can't just like cut out and leave, you know, um, or I could do the tenants thing, which would not really build on my ability as a dentist, but I'd have a job, but I also have my student loans. So long, short of is it, I made the pragmatic decision to come back home where I knew someone. And I was really fortunate to know a dentist here in Richmond who worked at a practice and I knew the practice and I knew it would be good. And I thought, man, this is the right move. This may not be romantically what I want to do right now, but um, this is the right move for being a dentist. And so sure enough, packed up uh, that uh, literally 13 months after moving out and drove back to Richmond. Wow. And moved back in with my mom <laughs> in the <laughs> attic. Um, How was that? Yes. Sobering, humbling. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after a year in LA, man. Oh, um, yeah. So, but it was good. And I uh, immediately just got to work on trying to build my career. And then bam, it's just, you know, five years goes by, seven years, eight years, 10 years. And um, it's amazing how, how quick the time has gone now. And I'm still in touch with some of the guys from Memorial. Um, James O'Neill, who played drums in Memorial, awesome drummer, plays in this band Naked Pictures now. They're so good. You should mm-hmm. check them out. Um, Brendan, who played guitar. Um, I have not kept up with him as much. Good guy. We just have not, I don't know what he's up to. And then Billy, who played, our, who played bass. But we sort of had a couple of different members in Memorial because yeah. between the first and second record, we had a bit of a change up there with the drummer and everything. So, but I kind of lost touch with people that were playing music or the people that I used to play a lot of music with had kind of moved on other projects. So mm-hmm. there wasn't that sort of natural, like, Hey, let's play some music, you know? Right. But that just hasn't happened. So now you said you got your pilot's license. Yeah. Uh, are you ever on a commercial flight? Do you ever like fantasize like, oh, if the pilot gets sick, you know, I can I can handle the situation. <laughs> <laughs> I know enough to know that. No, I cannot. <laughs> oh, OK. Oh, sure. I, I definitely feel like I could fly the thing. I'll, I'll keep it flying. But the process by which you land a, a, something like that, it's more of a computer problem than a, a, a stick and rudder problem, so to speak. I got you. So, yeah, that's right. It's all computerized now. So they'd be OK. Yeah, but usually what they would do, I think, is, you know, it, let's say that happened. They would divert you to the biggest, longest runway ever. Yeah. And there's, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and then everyone would say their prayers. <laughs> I don't know. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so has there ever been talk of Renee Hartfeld or Memorial playing again? Is there any chance? Yes, there has been talk of it, actually. Um, the problem of it is it's, you know, it is just reality. Colin has... Uh, a young son, um, Aaron is a PhD now, or, mm-hmm. uh, Aaron Barth, and he is married with a baby and they're, he just got a job at a college. So he's moving. He was in Richmond for a while. And we kind of thought, oh, we have a moment here, um, to do this. And then it just was a, an issue of, can we actually get together enough to relearn these songs and play them in such a way that people would want to see it? 
Yeah. And I think that was sort of enough to stop us from like getting too excited yeah. um, because we all realized like, ah, I don't know if we have that much time. Uh, but I mean, it's not totally off the table. I mean, uh, especially if there were to be interest in it, but it just is, I don't know, pragmatically if that could happen. I mean, I've sort of moved on a little musically. I, I'm certainly writing new stuff. I've always had like the, my own personal, uh, Chinese democracy or whatever. Yeah. Chinese democracy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the record that started 10 years ago. So it's there and I've been messing with all sorts of different sounds and kind of trying to imagine like, what would this even be? You know, yeah. but, uh, it just hasn't happened. So I can't say no, but, uh, probably more likely with Memorial than Renee. Although it seems like people would be more interested to see Renee. Well, you know, hearing that there's a chance makes me happy. So whether it's Renee or Memorial or both, if uh, I'll be there if it happens. So you're guaranteed at least one attendee. I'll be there. Uh, I'm glad Me too. I can make that too. Keep, keep it, Tommy, sweet. Yeah. You're on the guest list. <laughs> oh, no, fuck. we'll pay. No, we'll pay. Fuck yes. No, we never get on guest list. We we got to take advantage of this. Oh, we, Keith, we've been on guest list our entire lives. That's like, I know, that's how uh, we did. I know. I'm just playing the victim. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we always get on guest list. It's nice. <laughs> well, yeah. So let's talk about this. Uh, so this solo album that you've been working on, Pete. That's that's. Uh, or can we expect to hear that ever, or is it is it just still an idea at this point? Well, no. I've recorded like four songs, but it's all it's like more home recordings, and then you know you hear it for everything that it's not, like everyone does. And also, yeah. especially for that it's not with regards to being recorded. So mm -hmm. I keep thinking, am I going to sit down enough to really learn my DAW to record this properly? Or am I going to bring this somewhere to like ha and work with someone to record it properly? So I, I tend to just get in my own way on that. Um, I sure I'd like to do that. I just, yeah, I don't know. But no, it's more than just like an idea in my head. Now we've got the Renee Hartfeld LP reissue coming yeah. out. Right, and that's that's gonna have a bonus track. So when did, that's coming out on Black Friday, right? That's coming out on Black Friday on six six one three one records, and um, it's gonna have an unreleased track from um, Death of the Ghost Sessions. It's got, I think, like two songs off of when we played on a radio show acoustic. Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, there'll be some cool stuff there, but basically all of it recorded, and then it's gonna be uh, gatefold, I believe, and pretty cool vinyl pressing. Beautiful. I'm going to pick that up. There might be some unreleased memorial songs out there, but they're somewhere on a hard drive. So we're going to have to wait and hold our breath for those. Maybe <laughs> one day. Don't give up hope. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. And the Pete <laughs> solo record. Uh, we got to finish it, man. We we need more from you. Well, I appreciate hearing that, man. Maybe so then. Um, if I can figure out a way to do it and do it in a way that it will sound good and you guys would actually appreciate it, then uh, yeah, maybe. Do people still hit you up about these bands? Like, do you hear from people about these bands, like fawning over it like we are? Yeah, well, I mean, I will say it's few and far between, not to, uh, <laughs> but it is. And there are some people randomly through the years, for sure, who have very earnestly sent us messages saying, hey, you know, like, I just love the record. and I love what you guys did. And do you have any other music? And what are you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, and it will come sometimes just totally out of the blue. And often when I'm having like a terrible day or something, I'll see it. I'll be like, oh man, that's awesome. You know? And yeah, uh, that sort of definitely makes it worth it in a weird way. Cause it is, you know, doing a band, you want other people to hear it. You want, yeah. you want to share the work, right? You don't want to just, you know, the whole like, oh, I just wrote this song for myself. I mean, certainly there's a place for that, but probably the, there is some satisfaction just like what you were saying, where you just can connect with someone over a lyric or, or music. Mm -hmm. um, so that still means a lot. Um, yeah, and we have a few people, you know, every couple of people a month, maybe that, that reach out through, uh, Facebook primarily, or like I saw you, you had posted that thing on, I'm amazed when I go on YouTube that there's some people that have posted live shows or whatever. So there's a few people out there. It seems like who still remember Renee Hartfeld. Now I didn't even realize there were live sets on YouTube. I'm going to have to go check that out. Oh, YouTube, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you got me. Uh. <laughs> YouTube has its place for, for certain things, okay? Game reviews, old sets. Uh, YouTube is good for older stuff, but that my, my problem is if, if it's a brand new song, it's never on YouTube because of uh, copyright. They take it right down, so I can't share like the newer stuff with Tommy. That's true. Well, I mean, you sent me the... What did you send me the other day? And I was like, oh, this is good. 
but I found it right on YouTube right away. Uh, Juice World. Oh, it's up there. <laughs> yeah, dude, it was right. It was up there right away, and yeah. I was like, "Fuck, dude, this is like amazing." But it was it was instantaneous. Like I looked at it, and it was like, but uh, I I forget who posted it, but it was definitely like um, not somebody involved with the record making process. It's like, probably it was, down already. Yo, oh, think, I'm sure it is. Think about this, Juice World. Now the song we're talking about is Righteous. It's so good. But like no, Juice World is like Renee Hartfelt. But imagine like uh, beats instead of like guitars and drums. It's like it's like kind of similar. It really? is. It's oh yeah, dude. I I am like uh, so I I teach in in Trenton and kids always are like put on this, put on that, and ninety nine percent of the time it's garbage. But Juice World is one of those newer artists that's it, like hip hop that I'm like, wow, this actually this resonates like this it it. It it makes sense. Like it, it's good, and there's there's some really pretty heartfelt stuff in there. Not to pun on that, but <laughs> no, the new hip hop. There's like this new hip hop. It's basically like emo with trap beats, and if it, if it's done well, it's fucking awesome. Yeah, there's some that 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 Juice World track is unbelievable. It's just like, heartbreaking. So considering because the guy overdosed and died, and he's just talking about like relapsing and being depressed, and it's just like. And how, how dr- drugs rule his life, and that he yeah. can he considers drugs as his only solution. It's 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 hard to listen to, but at the same time, it's one of those things that it definitely has its place, and it is it's really smart. Like it's vi- like it, people are easy to dismiss that stuff and go like, oh well, it's just it's yeah. It give it a chance, really, just give it a chance. Like I I, I was very skeptical at first because remember you sent me um, you didn't like it at first. I converted you. Sent- you. No, remember you sent me the one where the the album looked like uh, I was like, this looks like a Game Gear, oh, like a PlayStation <laughs> Two game, yeah. <laughs> Death Race uh, for Love, yeah. Juice World with uh, at our fourteen and fifteen year old Izzy and Taylor uh, through my wife's first marriage, um, they love Juice World and were so destroyed when he died. Yeah, but it's wild too because that yeah, I mean the lyrics are like drenched in drug imagery. Oh yeah, um, but it is real and like emo sort of. D- I see that like, oh yeah, you guys are kind of doing that sort of emo thing where you're hard on the sleeve, but yes. you can't deny that that is really emo's contribution that somehow they got, it's hard to describe exactly, but the way the lyric is, the earnestness of it, I guess, I don't know. There's some stuff that I listen to, like I, I brought this up previously, but like um, whenever I drive my kids down that we go to go down the shore and uh, I, I play Promise Ring, Nothing Feels Good. Uh, and my yeah. daughters are all my daughters call it beach music. They're like, no, oh, that's the one that has like the beach because like the front of it looks like um, yeah. it, it's like a, a cut from like, it, you know, the Atlantic City boardwalk. Like, um, but like it, it, my kids just resonate. It's one of these things. It just sounds so good. But <laughs> when you really listen to the lyrics, you're like, wow, this is so sad. Like there's so many things that are just horrific in it. Like you're like, oh, this is so terrible. Like then literally the album is called Nothing Feels Good. Like, <laughs> like, how 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 awful is that? Like and my daughters are always they're like, put that on, put that on. I'm like, uh, you know what? I'm not in the mood for that. Like uh <laughs> Oh yeah, Pete, that's another thing I meant to ask you. You uh what's your home situation? You're married? Yes. Yeah. Uh, um and live we live right in Richmond and uh, we have Katie's again, kids through her first marriage, Isabel and Taylor uh, who are 14 and 16. Wow. Yeah. See my girlfriend who I'm think I'm moving in with uh, in a couple months, she has a 14 year old and that's uh, thankfully everybody gets along pretty nicely and it's a, uh, you know, it's good. It's, it's, I tell you, it's a brand new experience for me because I never even thought I would live with someone I was in a relationship with, but you know, now I'm doing that, and she has a kid, so I'm doing it all. That's all. Yeah, I don't have a lot of friends who have the similar a similar situation to me in that way, like being a stepdad kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it is unique, but it's awesome. And again, I didn't picture it either. You know, you kind of never expect that, and then it, and then all of a sudden it's happened, and you're like, all right. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And me and the kid have like we have similar interests. She likes video games and junk food and like being on the computer. And I mean, shit, that's what I do too. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome that you relate. I mean, yeah. I mean, in, in the, end of the day, I think that that's uh, the relationship is all that really matters. The, the, the whole, yeah. Who's parent or whatever, especially as they're getting older and older, it matters less and less. And you're becoming more of just a, 
an influence and mentor and all these other things. So it's kind of a unique position I get to play, you yes. know, because certainly being the father and being a mother, I mean, respect, it, it's also a whole different emotional um, place than maybe it's just a different emotional place to be in as a stepdad or a step. Absolutely. Like I, I, I like to stick my nose in things and like impart my wisdom sometimes. So I, I have to be really careful not to do that because it's, it's not appropriate in some cases. So I, I just try to be as supportive as possible and shut up when I need to. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> as, as someone that had a stepdad that kind of sucked. Yeah. Please do that. <laughs> I think about that, Tommy. I actually do think you? about thank that. You. Yeah. I was going to say, thank you. I appreciate that because he was just definitely one of those people that, um, imposed his own belief system and his way of running things uh without question there was no like discussion or argument uh, now uh, that's not to say that like, i didn't learn things from him and that he wasn't um somebody i in certain ways looked up to um he's very successful he's uh, very um he's been in terms of like now like my wife and i are both teachers like investing money wise like he's the person i go to when i'm like uh all right look uh we have this you know extra windfall of money like what do we do with it when when i have money in this money market account what do i do where am i investing like what are you doing now because he's been retired for 20 years almost at this point and and lives off of just trading his you know trading stocks like and it's 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 incredible to see that but at the same time um, you know, there was times where, well, Keith has been around him before. He's a, a difficult person to get along with. <laughs> he's just kind of like, you know, he's, he's just kind of there. He, it's not like, Hey, how you doing? You know, asking questions and stuff. He's just kind of like there, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, he's definitely, he's a, and the other thing is he's kind of a presence, but yes. he's also, uh, he's a little bit he's a bit much for some, when people first meet him, they're always like, Oh, he's so nice. I'm like, well, give him a moment. <laughs> just give him shit. Give, give him some time. I was, bring up politics right now. See how that goes off. <laughs> like, you know, was dad, so you had a stepdad and, uh, your paternal dad was he? Yeah. yeah. So my, my paternal dad died when I was five and then my mom remarried when I was, uh, well, <laughs> when my mom actually, like literally remarried um, when I was 28. Uh, my mom moved in with my stepfather when I was 14. Yeah. So it was a, it was a wild time because it was definitely like, but I mean, it, keep in mind, it, it was also uh, a lot of time of transition for a lot of us in the family where, um, so I have uh, two sisters and I have three stepsisters and all of us being together at once was really my stepsisters are awesome like i like i told you <laughs> i texted my stepsister today like to be like hey how's everything going down there like uh we're having a guest on the podcast tonight like we stay in touch a lot like we we are close but um we've always discussed like our relationship with our like their father and my stepfather as like Oh, uh, well, that's just how he is. Like, you, you just kind of, you you either take it or leave it. Like, it, it, he is a uh, an acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and I think about that. I don't, I don't want to do that. And that's another crazy connection, Tommy. You moved in with your stepfather when you were 14. 14. And yeah. I'm going to move in with my girlfriend and her kid, and she's 14, the kid. Yeah, and she's daughter. actually, and she's choosing high schools right now, which was... Um, I, I do owe a large part of this. Uh, there were a couple options for me in terms of going to high schools. And I remember my mom uh, speaking to me specifically about uh, I had gotten a partial scholarship to uh, an all boys private school in Philadelphia. And my mom was like, look, um, you can kind of go wherever you want. Just know that if you make the decision to go to this school, um, you're going to have to get a job to help financially. My mom worked uh, nights at a prison. So she was like, you, this is just, it's, it's untenable for us. Like we can't do this financially. So um, when we moved into his house, uh, I, I think maybe a month or so in that 
first month I was there, he was like, look, I think you should go to this school and here's why. And he sat down and broke it down for me. And I, I literally, it was life changing for me, like going to that school as opposed to, I mean, I didn't go to the other school, obviously, I didn't live that life. So I don't know what my life would have turned out like. However, what I was exposed to at that school and the people I met and the level of education that I got um, got me much further in life than I think a lot of my peers did that went to that school, that went to the other option. Yeah. So that's one good thing he did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> look, one one column for the good. Let's go. <laughs> let's not address the bad. <laughs> Pete, we want to thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad I tracked you down because, you know, like I mentioned before, Renee Hartfelt Memorial, it's music I've just connected with so much over the years and that I come back to time and time again. And uh, we look forward to more. I hope I get to see you again. So thanks. Uh, thanks for talking to us. Hey, Keith, Tommy, it's great talking to you guys, and thanks for reaching out, and uh, it's been my pleasure, man. So hopefully uh, we'll meet in real life one day. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, that would be awesome. And folks, listen, become a member of the Northeast Scene today. Click that follow button. Click that like button. Subscribe to us on Apple and Spotify and Podbean and all the other random sites I see our RSS feed feeding into, you know, that display our podcast. Uh rate us review us write us we haven't been getting many reviews so we need more uh and write us write us with your stories and uh you know everything northeast scene at gmail.com we want to hear from you and i'm going to continue to put up your flyers and the stuff you send me when i remember and when we have time and we're going to keep coming back every week every monday new podcast no matter what's going on sickness health death plague Actually, the kind of is a plague right now, and we're still doing it. So, yeah. So, thank you, everybody, for being here, and until next time. Yay!